Hi guys, welcome to my channel. Before we get started, make sure to hit that like button and also subscribe to my channel. Can AI create a life? So make sure to watch the full video. Researchers are creating devices that some would consider to be alive utilizing living elements. They have since begun to reproduce. The metal clad machine with electrical control is typically what we envision when we conceive of a robot as some sort of synthetic servant. We wouldn't think of it as being alive even if it could perform tasks for us and possibly even communicate with us in a smart way. However, what if we created robots using the soft materials that nature uses rather than creating them out of hard, lifeless materials? How about constructing them from cells instead? The University of Vermont's Professor Josh Bongard's lab is conducting research using precisely this strategy. They have been inventing and building xenobots, or little robots constructed from living frog cells, for the past four years. The strategy is described by Bongard as follows. The components themselves have no intelligence. If you make a robot out of metal and plastic, do we have a whole new method of addressing robotics? From parts that are also incredibly intelligent machines, we are creating something new. For many years, robotics has been influenced by nature. Actuators modeled after genuine muscles have been developed as a result, facilitating easier movement of robots. Robots can scale vertical glass elsewhere using pads that resemble gecko's feet. The building blocks of nature themselves are used to create xenobots. Dr. Victoria Webster Wood, a specialist in biologically inspired robots at Carnegie Mellon University, claims that this type of methodology enables us to directly harness living materials' natural adaptability. Bongard Cenobots are intriguing because they can be created without any genetic tinkering using ordinary cells extracted from frog embryos. Even though it was already known that these cells could move independently, in this case they are being used as materials to create predictable, robot-like behaviors, such as herding particles in a petri dish, working together like sheepdogs, and even giving birth to balls of other cells that might be considered to be xenobot babies. Selective Artificial Means The xenobot's talents certainly make them potentially valuable for a variety of activities, even though it's unclear what exactly in their inner workings, or rather, those of the frog cells, causes them to behave in this fashion. Cleaning up microplastics, for instance, or as the researchers described in their initial study on the xenobots, released in 2020, crawling to the site of damaged tissues in humans to assist in their recovery. Therefore, where do you begin if you want to create a xenobot? The Vermont team's process begins in a computerized version of a Petri dish, where a program that uses artificial intelligence, AI, evolves groups of frog cells based on their structure to carry out the desired function. Moving garbage around and piling it in a mound, a group of xenobots tidies up a Petri dish. It creates a population of virtual xenobots, deletes the ones that perform poorly, and makes randomly modified copies of the survivors, explains Bongard. The scientists instruct the AI how many iterations of this artificial selection process to run, and in a matter of seconds, they have their final design. An effective design for transporting goods might be, as an illustration, a pouch-like form made of a ball of cells with a hole in the middle. Dr. Falk Tauber, a bio-inspired technology expert located at the University of Freiburg in Germany, believes that the eye-based design process is the real masterpiece of the team's methodology. He points out that evaluating hundreds of various cell arrangements would need to be done in a real Petri dish which may take weeks or even months. This offers the chance to adopt only the most promising strategies that have succeeded in the computer, he argues, in addition to offering a significant time advantage. He suggests that other scenarios, such as the quick creation of customized organ transplants that perfectly match a patient's anatomy, could also benefit from the AI method. The next step is the most laborious since real cells must be used to translate the virtual designs. Dr. Doug Blackiston, a biologist based at Tufts University in Massachusetts, is the team's lone xenobot sculptor, and it is a procedure that takes him hours to complete for each millimeter-scale robot. 
Blackiston meticulously uses microsurgery tools to sculpt tissue taken from frog embryos in the manner specified by the act. He says, for me, it's a lot like drawing or working on art, and he likes to see how the shapes come together. He does acknowledge, though, that in order to produce more than the 30 to 40 xenobots a week that are now produced, in order for the xenobots to find practical applications, the process will need to be sped up. That development might be made possible by 3D printing, which employs cells and tissues as the inks for prints. Accelerating development. After a little more than a week of swimming or crawling about a dish, the xenobots eventually disintegrate. Since they don't eat, their lifespan is short. In their initial research, scientists combine skin and heart cells to create walking xenobots. The piston-like action of the heart cells caused the xenobots to move. Currently, however, they use skin cells and make use of beating cilia which project from the outer surface of the cell balls and allow them to swim. The researchers initially speculated that the Xenobots could be able to move objects after observing their movements, but they questioned whether the Xenobots would be powerful enough to accomplish this. According to Blackiston, he began with very light dye particles that were strewn around the bottom of the Petri dish like a thin layer of ash or snow. I happened to get lucky on the first try, and it worked. Also capable of moving tiny glass beads were the Xenobots. Following the development of the swimming Xenobots, scientists began giving swarms of the tiny robots more interesting objects to move around, such as cells, which are also the building blocks of the actual Xenobots. When the swarm started pushing the cells into small piles, an intriguing phenomenon started to occur. The piles tended to stick together because frog cells are sticky, and after a few days, cilia, which resemble the hairs on the surface of Cenobots, began to grow on the heap surface. And after that, according to Bongard, Doug Blackiston noticed that a few of them had begun to move. The Cenobots were obviously growing in number at this moment. It wasn't your typical have sex, have a baby situation, but it was a replication process that hadn't previously been observed in the wild. Blackiston claimed that if the circumstances were just right, he knew the experiment would be successful. The first time he used a Zoom call to show one of the children moving around, it didn't make Bonger and the team any less enthralled. The biologists and computer scientists, as Bonger recalls, were silent on the call. You know, self-replication is kind of a hope for machines in general, and to see it, it completely blew my mind, said the author. After realizing their xenobots could self-replicate, the researchers instructed their AI to create improved iterations of the machines. According to Bongard, the exponential utility of the xenobots' ability to self-replicate opens up a vast array of potential uses. Any technology that accomplishes a useful task and improves in utility as it gains popularity falls under this concept. Vaccines, technologies that could put out forest fires, and environmental cleanup are all appropriate examples. These technologies could benefit from a self-replicating carrier to aid in their spread, though, as they can't do it on their own. Even though this is all just a theory, the researchers were able to demonstrate through computer modeling that if they fed the Xenobots enough cells and they continued to proliferate, the Xenobots' ability to perform basic tasks like moving wires around in a circuit, would continue to grow. The important thing to keep in mind is that the parent bots can only create children under specified circumstances, which, as Webster Wood points out, the researchers regulate. If self-replicating Cenobots sound like the kind of sci-fi movie scenario we should avoid, then this is something to keep in mind. They can't multiply at all if there aren't any more free-floating cells available. Additionally, the team's Xenobots die quickly and biodegrade. These tiny cellular robots, in Tauber's words, could not live in the outside world and are safely housed in the laboratories of Bongard's team. As a matter of fact, Tauber would never refer to them as living because of how dependent they are on such particular circumstances. However, according to Bongard, the Xenobots are beginning to blur the distinction between living and non-living reigniting the discussion about what constitutes life 
along with other technologies, such as biohybrids, which combine organic and technological components. Other questions have been raised in the meantime by the Xenobots' behavior. When Xenobots push cells and other objects around collectively, for instance, the researchers are unsure if the Xenobots are actually cooperating. Are there millions of distinct receptors on the surface of live cells that they can use to detect one another? Or do they just scurry about aimlessly like wind-up toys? Of course, it is equally exciting to wonder if the team intends to go down the path of creating biological robots from human cells. So, that's it for today. We hope you enjoyed the video. Use the comments section below to tell us your thoughts about the video. Also, make sure to subscribe to our channel and click the bell button to be notified of all the latest videos.